Well, just to let you know, I received, or we received, for those of you who don't know, we live stream our services here, received a, a little message from Wynette Marcus that they are watching us right now. And it said just that, we are watching you. Very big brother-ish, very ominous in its tone. But just to let you know, honey, the kids want you home. Now. Um, they are eager, our children are eager to have mommy back home. You know, it's, it's becoming a little desperate at the house over just a couple of hours. So He hasn't fed us in days. He put a bowl out in the center of the room and said, eat, and it was not fair. So, um, but here we are today. We are coming here right now to talk about a topic which I feel distinctly uncomfortable talking about. Um, this month has been focused on giving, and I don't feel comfortable talking about giving. I'm just not a guy who's ever felt comfortable about that. Um, when it comes down to giving and the church and issues of money and issues of what you have and what you're going to give to the service of the Lord, it's never been a topic that I felt comfortable with. Part of it is because I have seen over the years how pastors, Christian leaders, have abused the privilege of being able to receive monies into the church. They've used those funds for their own benefit. Or they've lived such a grandiose life that it, it makes the church look bad. And then the other part of it is that there are times where churches with the best of intentions, with wonderful leadership, have just been really bad in handling what it is that God has blessed the congregation with. That reality on top of, then, my own feelings about money. You know, I'm, I'm happy to give to charitable causes. Um, we support a child through World Vision. We've been doing this for years. We're on our second child now because the first child aged out of the program, as it were. And that's been a blessing. All of us here contribute in one way or another to, to something going on in the community, and that's wonderful. But something in my mind switches when I hear people standing in the pulpit talking about give money, when I hear people asking from a position like this for funds for the church or this or that or the other thing, it's a time where I don't feel comfortable as just a person in the pew because for a long time before I stood in this area, I was just a person in the pew. And then the third thing, I do a lot of internal workings of these ideas, the third place in which I don't feel comfortable is just, it's as a, a pastor. Because I, I feel really good when I have to talk to a Jehovah's Witness and present the gospel to them. I, I feel very comfortable talking with a Roman Catholic about the, what the Lord's Supper is or, or taking on social issues. I feel comfortable in that. But for some reason, when you bring up money, it's just something that as a pastor... I don't feel comfortable talking about for those other reasons that I indicated a moment ago and I'm afraid people are going to look at me and, and hear me and not hear what it is that I'm trying to say. But here, unfortunately, what the narrative has become in our culture about giving and the church. If there's one topic that I would love to avoid talking about for all the days of my life, it's this one. And yet that's what I've been called to do. And so as an obedient servant, I'm going to do that because as I've looked into it and as I've, this is really more of a check in my spirit. It's a check in my attitude. So what I would like for us to do today is we're going to kind of wrap up what the past month has been about, and we're also going to begin looking to next month and next year and where Central Baptist Church is going. So if you could please stand to your feet. Our passage for today is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. When you have it, if you could please say amen. Amen. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you start with God, if you start with God, you will end up with a generous life. If you start with God, you will end up with a generous life. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely of their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this servant's service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Let's bow for prayer. Father, your word is a wonderful word. Lord, you challenge us from the places that are easy to the places that are hard. And I ask, Lord God, that as we talk today, that you would give my heart and my mind peace. Lord God, that through the working of the Holy Spirit, that the entire congregation would be of one heart and one mind about what it means to serve you. In your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And I will take a drink of water. The situation of uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, the church in Corinth, as we've talked about before, the church in Corinth was a very interesting church. They were a church that was in the center of a uh, very commercial area. The particular place where Corinth was meant that it was a very rich and prosperous city. And when Paul had come into Corinth and had presented the gospel, it seems from when you read through 1 and 2 Corinthians that a number of people of good means had come to Christ. And so the church started off with a good financial backing behind it. And that was something that was really excellent. Now, over time, the church had some issues, theological issues, issues with Paul himself, and that's covered in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The issue that's coming up here is the issue of an offering that Paul was collecting from all of the churches to send back to Jerusalem. We think that Paul's writing 1st and 2nd Corinthians in the early 50s AD. All right, so Jesus died in 3033. So about 20 years after the resurrection of Christ, Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthian church, these letters to the Corinthian church. In the 40s, in Palestine, there was an, a drastic famine and drought. And people did not have a way, the Jews who were living there did not have a way, especially the Christians who had been pushed off to the side because of their commitment to Christ. By this time, Christianity was not seen as just a subset of Judaism, but had been recognized because Gentiles were coming into the church as something separate. And so the Jews who believed in Christ had begun to be persecuted by the Jews who were in Jerusalem. So the things that the Jews who were Christians would have access to in Jerusalem help from the temple, other people to be able to... that whole community that would be there to support them, they had been dismissed from. And so there was no support mechanism for people to be able to get food. In Orthodox Jewish communities to this day, you see that dynamic in place. Someone who professes faith in Christ is basically pronounced dead by the family. 
If you go to Williamsburg, certain sections, you will find that if one of those Jewish men or women becomes a Christian, they will have a funeral for that person because they are dead to the family. That dynamic was what was happening in Jerusalem. And so Paul was going around to different churches to get funding so that when he went back to Jerusalem, he would have the monetary support to be able to buy food and all of the things that the Christian community, the Jewish Christian community needed. And he was doing this to provide for them, but also, look, the Jews are having some tensions within themselves right now about accepting Gentiles into the church. If the Gentiles come with a great donation to help them in their great time of need, it kind of begins to smooth over some of the acrimony, the angst that is there. It leads the way for harmony within the body of Christ. Now, this area of Macedonia where Paul was, where he's talking about that he, the grace that God gave the Macedonian churches, this would have included the cities of Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, right? So when you read the letter to the Thessalonians, when you lead, read Philippians, it's all of those churches. So Paul is taking up an offering from all of these different churches to be able to take back. And this church, which is in Corinth, which is very well off, Paul starts from a very interesting place because he begins talking about that God gave a grace to Macedonia. Now, usually when we talk about grace, what we mean is what Christ has done on the cross to forgive us of our sins. The grace of Christ, which we have received, and so now we are part of the body of Christ. Now we are part of the family of God. But Paul doesn't mean that kind of grace right here. When Paul talks about grace in this section, because he goes on in the next section, in the next verse, to talk about what he means by that grace. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. At that point, you're thinking, oh, people in Macedonia are being saved. That's fantastic. Paul clarifies, out of the most severe trial, their overwhelming joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. The grace that God had given the churches in Macedonia, yes, it was Christ, but it was a lot more than that. It was them doing something far above and beyond what anybody would have ever expected. That's basically what grace is. A grace is something that is given beyond what anybody would ever expect. That's why when you go to a restaurant, what do you leave at the end? A tip. It's also called gratuity, right? Gratuity comes from this word, grace. You're giving a grace. When you give your tip, you don't take it off of the bill. If your bill's $20 and you want to give your server $5, you don't change the amount of the bill to $15 so that you can give five. Some of us will try to do that. But what you do is you pay that $20 and then you put down five on top of it. Why? To provide the server with something that they would not have otherwise. Their regular hourly pay is not including that tip. That tip is extra. It's a gratuity. Okay? It is an act of grace. So when you go out to eat, be gracious to your servers. They will appreciate it greatly. Now, God, when God created the universe and everything that was in it, that was not an act of grace. That was a demonstration of God's power. God could do it, and so he did it. When God saves us from the penalty of our sin, that's an act of grace. We've all committed sin. We are all in a place where we could rightly and justifiably be damned to hell for what we have done against the Lord. But what God does is provide grace, something he didn't have to do, but he takes on, as we studied in Philippians chapter 2, the very image of the creation coming in the appearance of a man and dies on the cross for our sins. It's an act of grace. It's not something he had to do, but it's something he does for us because he loves us. He does it to show his love. And that's the very basis of the gospel. And so when we get to this first part of, 
of verse 1 right here, we're expecting to hear that this grace of the saving faith of Christ was what was evident. But no, we're talking about that God's grace to the Macedonian churches was for them to give more than anybody would expect. Overwhelming joy overcomes the worries of poverty. That's one of the places that Paul drives us here. That overwhelming joy overcomes the worries of extreme poverty. Rich generosity wins. Rich generosity wins. Let me tell you about the Macedonian church. Everything that the church in Corinth was, Macedonia was not. If Corinth was Wall Street in New York City, Macedonia was the Appalachian Hills of Tennessee and West Virginia. Everything that you could find in Corinth, you could not find in Macedonia. If a Macedonian went from Philippi down to Corinth, it was like the Beverly Hillbillies. All of a sudden, Jeb showed up and is in a place of lush everything after coming out of nothing. So that's where the Macedonians were. The Macedonians were Pope, right? Couldn't even afford OR. They were just Pope folk. That's all that they were. That's all that they had. They were just Pope. They had nothing. So what do you think? Do you think, as the Macedonians do, do you think that your giving of your money or your talents or whatever it is is an act of God's grace? Do you look at giving as an act of God's grace in your life? Or do you see it as a place of obligation? Do you see it as a place of obedience? We need to change our minds. The act of giving is an act of God's grace. The opportunity to, to give to the needs of others is an act of God's grace. Because Paul is testifying here, these Macedonians were so poor, they had nothing. And so Paul didn't even really bring it up to them, the opportunity to give. Paul's testifying that after the Macedonians received Christ, the entirety of their lifestyle changed. Their entire outlook on life changed after Paul presented Christ. Because Christ didn't just affect their hearts. Paul, Christ affected the entirety of the way that they looked at the world. That's why he talks about verse 4, that they urgently pleaded with us. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you met somebody who was really, really, really poor, who urgently pleaded with you to give you money? That's what Paul's proclamation of Christ has done in the hearts of people who have nothing. Remember back in February, McDonald's had a new ad campaign that came out? It was where they were doing things out of love. The, the whole tagline was choose loving. And the commercials were you would go up to the counter and you'd order your meal. And they'd say, we don't want you to pay for it. Why don't you call your mom? And the guy at the counter would be like, you want me to what? Meals free as long as you call your mother. Or you know, give a hug to someone over here or do so. The whole concept that McDonald's was trying to give, get was that we're going to spread love. You don't have to pay for your meal. Now, you don't have to pay for your meal. We're just going to give love to everybody. And people were surprised by this. And not every McDonald's had to do it, but they all could. Now, McDonald's was smart. They only allowed 100 of these opportunities per, per day. All right? And they only did it for one month. And they chose February, the shortest month, to be able to do it. But they said you could pay with love. You could pay with love. When even one of the largest companies in the world can recognize that love can be a gift to other people, that love is as good as any monetary exchange, Aren't we a people who should be able to realize that as well? Now, that doesn't mean that you don't then give to other people. They're saying, hey, for this, change your mind. Change how you think about what it is to pay for something, 
to give something away. And we should be ecstatic. There's no end to the love campaign that God has put in front of us. The love campaign of God is one that knows no bounds. It doesn't have a one-month marker. It's not just a hundred of them per day. Thousands of people every day receive the love of Christ, but does the love of Christ get reflected in the entirety of their being? And what Paul challenges the Corinthian church here regarding is the Macedonians, when they even thought there was an opportunity, said we are going to give, and they gave right at that moment. Paul, when you look down here at verse 6, so we urge Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. You see, the Corinthian church had said, we'll give, we will absolutely give to the offering to go to Jerusalem. And then they didn't. And they didn't because of personal issues with Paul. They didn't because of a whole host of issues that were going on in the church. But they didn't follow through in their commitment. This is a church that had the funding to be able to do it. They had the means so that they could give. And they didn't do it. And Paul's using, if you people who are rich can make a commitment and not follow through on it, and you think that that is an expression of God's love, what should you be thinking about when you look at people who are dirt poor, who didn't just give, but gave more than we ever expected? Look at how Paul talks here. Verse 3, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely of their own. Paul doesn't even mention to them the option to give. Probably because Paul's looking at their situation and saying, it would, I, I would feel horrible asking people who are getting by on nothing here to give to this church. I mean, the people of Macedonia are basically in the same position as the people in Jerusalem. I would feel guilty for even asking. The love of Christ comes into their heart in Macedonia. And as soon as they hear it, the conversa- you know, what did the conversation sound like? Hey, Paul, where are you going next? Well, I've got to go down to Corinth because we're taking some, uh, a collection to go back to Jerusalem. You're taking a collection? Really? Can we give to the collection? Uh, you know, it, it looks a little desperate, right? I, if, if you would like to give to the collection, that would be fine. And Paul's expecting $10 to show up in the offering plate to go back to Jerusalem. But Paul looks in the offering plate and he goes, there's... There's $5,000 here. There's so much more than I ever would have expected. I mean, where did you even get this? That you would be able to give this away. But they look in their hearts and they say, there are other people in another place who are in as desperate of a situation as we are. We need to give to help them. You see, their first thought is the love of someone else. Their first thought is, what Christ has done for me I can make an example of by giving to someone else in a sacrificial way. I can give this away. That seems to be as far as they think about it. And their hearts are immediately open to to doing that. They're not unlike the church in Smyrna. If you read Revelation 2.9, John, in writing to the church in Smyrna, says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. John looks at this church in Smyrna and says, you guys have a horrible set of circumstances going on in your life. And yet because of that, you're rich. Look at how you give to others. Look at how you celebrate. Paul, in verse 10 here, and here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. It's been a year It's been a year since they said that they would give. And they still haven't followed through on their promise. He's challenging the Corinthians here to regain the passion that they once had. To be like the Macedonians. Because the Macedonians don't look special, but they're special. The Corinthians look special, but they're not. See, they're kind of like this pulpit here. Normally up here we have, you can see it in the back on your way out if you've never seen it before, an ornate and beautiful pulpit. It is gorgeous. Came with the church. 
Love it. And wonderful men of God have preached from that pulpit for almost a hundred years. That looks like the pulpit of a pastor. This, this is not so hot. This has got nicks and scrapes. It's pretty small. It barely covers me. This is not very special, and yet it's doing exactly what I need for it to do at this particular moment. It's holding my papers. It's holding the scriptures. It's giving me a place to, to look at it. It's giving me something to grab onto when I need to for dramatic effect. It's giving me something to be here with. Right? It's giving a sense of stability. You see, this doesn't look impressive, but it's able to do everything that that impressive-looking pulpit over there does. This is a solid Macedonian pulpit. Now, there's nothing wrong with that Corinthian pulpit over there, I want you to know. And I love standing behind that Corinthian pulpit over there. But this is simple and does what it's supposed to do. And if it had a heart, I think it would be overjoyed to do what it's doing right now. If this pulpit could dance, it would dance. It would be joyful in the Lord that it gets to hold the word of God and stand up here with me to present to you all of the truths that are in this scripture right here. This is a happy pulpit. And we should be the same way. This pulpit is special and it's beautiful almost because of its simplicity and its basicness. So when we look here at Paul, that they did it entirely of their own, Paul doesn't make a mention of the offering and, and he doesn't appear to coerce them in any way. And Paul also does not talk about that what they gave was reckless or unbalanced. He simply talks about it being beyond what any natural expectation would be. Now, I don't think that Paul would talk about the Macedonian church just in relationship to money. I think money happened to be the particular instance that happened at this time. There's an offering we're taking up. That has to do with money. But the character of the Macedonians indicates that there are people who are kind of down for whatever. You know, that whole Bud Light thing that's going on right now. Are you down for whatever? Are you ready to do whatever happens at any moment? Are you down for whatever? Well... The Macedonians are down for whatever. They are ready at any moment. You need someone who is going to show what it means to give. Macedonians are your people. They are ready to give right now. You want someone who's going to help build a barn. Macedonians can build a barn like nobody's business. They will be there because that's where their heart is. That's why they are the example that Paul looks to. They're not attached to the things of this world. They're very ready to give them away. We had a blessing this week that I want to tell you about. We're preparing for Hallelujah Night. Some of you may have seen this come up on our Instagram account. We are preparing for Hallelujah Night here at the church. And Hallelujah Night happens on October 31st. And what we do is we gather all the people, as many as we can, to bring them into the sanctuary. We have prizes and giveaway. We have games. We have music. We have a celebration that goes on here in the church. And it's a wonderful time. And we present the gospel to people who otherwise might not hear it. We provide a place of safety and sanctuary. And the kids can get dressed up and, and receive candy and those sorts of things. But this is a way to celebrate something that's worthy of celebrating and not celebrating something demonic or evil. When we give stuff away, some of the things we like to give away, bikes, scooters, we've given away TVs and things like that. We've only begun talking about what it is that we need to gather here at Central Baptist Church for Hallelujah Night. And one of the things I was going to talk about was bikes. Word got out. There was a ringing on the doorbell the other day, I think it was on like a Wednesday, and I got a phone call and they said, Robert, you need to go down to the side to help some people. And the trunk of the car opened up and six or seven bikes came into the church. Amen. But wait, there's more. The important tagline to all of this is, 
There's more coming tomorrow. We couldn't fit it all in the car today. Aha. Tomorrow comes, Thursday. Bing bong. Robert, can you please go downstairs to help them with the bikes? Sure I can. Happy to do so. Go downstairs. Trunk opens up. Bikes come out. Now we're up to about 11, 12 bikes. But wait. There's more. Sorry, we're coming back. We couldn't fit them all in the car today. There's more coming tomorrow. That's a Macedonian heart. There is no end. There's that sense of there's always going to be just one more. There's going to be a moment of where it gets bigger and bigger. You know, it's kind of like when the, how the Grinch stole Christmas. At the end of it, his heart gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That attitude of giving gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? Because God's attitude of giving in us is bigger and bigger and bigger. It keeps going and going. If you have a Macedonian heart, it doesn't matter the amount. You don't have to provide 15, 20 bikes, whatever it may be. You don't have to do that. But your attitude towards giving needs to be one that is bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's where my heart had to be really worked on this past week in wrestling through these scriptures. God's grace is that he allows us to give. Think of what God could provide on God's own. The answer is everything and anything. God could make it so that you never had to do anything in your life at all. But that's not a value that God wants to instill in us. That's how you make babies, not how you make adults. You make babies by feeding them and feeding them and feeding them and feeding them and never letting them do anything on their own. How do you mature people? You mature people by giving them challenges, by helping them to grow, by being by their side and by not doing everything for them all the time. People will sometimes look at the absence of God in a particular situation and say, well, where was God? He doesn't care. He didn't deal with this issue. And I think God's response oftentimes is, I told you to deal with it. Grow up. Have a generous heart that looks at an opportunity to give as truly that, an opportunity to give, an opportunity to reflect the love and the grace of Christ. I don't want you to hear all this talk about capital campaigns and, and monies here in the church as an, as an attempt to try to coerce you to give more. I'm going to tell you my heart on this. If you feel coerced, don't give a dime to Central Baptist Church. If you feel that it's an obligation to meet the standards of the people sitting next to you, don't give any money. But if you have joy in your heart for what God has done for you and what you can do for other people, even though you think, I don't have much, but I can pour this out on the altar, I can give this over to God, if that's the attitude of your heart, there will never be an end to what you are able to give. Now, that one didn't get as much applause. That's okay. That's okay. What I want you to do is I want you to pray about where's my heart truly in relationship to giving? Does it see first and foremost that if I start with Christ, if I start with God, I'm going to end up with a really generous life? Maybe the challenge is in that in the area of your wallet, in the area of your talents, maybe you haven't started with God yet. Maybe you've trusted God for your salvation. The spiritual stuff I am completely on point with. But the things of this world, I'm still kind of with this world on it. Everything in our lives needs to be put under God. Starting at what would God have me to do? And trusting God to then get you through. There's two major points to take out of this. One, Sacrificial giving is praiseworthy. Look what Paul does here talking about the Macedonians. He praises them. Because when we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, that's worthy of praise. That shows the life of Christ being lived in us. 
And also that Christian giving is part of our surrender to Christ. The Macedonians knew what it was intimately to be economically challenged and taken, taken advantage of. And I'll tell you what, most of the people in the ancient world did. We talk today about, you know, one percenters. In the ancient world, that was really true. There was no middle class. There was the one percent and there was the 99 other. And the 99 other had nothing. The one percent Corinthian church didn't do it. But the 99% Macedonian churches said, yes, this is where my heart is because of what God has done for me, and so I will do. Their healing gave them an understanding of Christ and his grace that went far beyond anything that they had known before. And it gave them a perspective that was grounded in God's use of all that we have. If you start with God, you will end up with a generous life. Let's pray. Father, I do not know where it is that I need to consider sacrifice, but I know, Lord, I need to start from the place that says, I love you. I need to start from a place that says, I am willing to do more than what I think I can do. Lord, let me and mine be surprised at the offering that we give in service to your church. Lord God, whether it is in a capital campaign or, Lord God, the giving of, of talents here at the church or, or witnessing to the world, Lord God, let me be overwhelmed with joy that I have an opportunity to take part in your mission. Lord God, in myself with regards to money, would you clear my head? Would you allow me to start over and start with you? Father, please, let me be a, a better person in this regard. Make me more like your son. Allow me to trust more in the work of your spirit. Bless us today, Lord God. Please help us, and please help us to shine. In your name, Lord, amen.